Microsoft Word, PowerPoint, Excel. They are fixtures of office life everywhere. But it's almost 30 years since Microsoft released the iconic Office 95. In the space of just a few months, though, the company that once gave us the likes of Clippy, the interactive paperclip, has suddenly become one of the most important players in the rapid rise of artificial intelligence. And it all has to do with its collaboration with OpenAI, the creator of the wildly popular ChatGPT that seems to be taking over the world, and that some people fear actually will take over the world. If you went back a couple of years and you asked people of Silicon Valley, like, who's in the lead in AI, they would have said Google. And I think everyone agrees now that Microsoft is either kind of like in the lead or has at least gotten to parity with Google. I'm Wes Kosova. Today on The Big Take, Bloomberg Businessweek writer Max Chafkin is here with the unlikely story of how Microsoft, of all companies, is making itself cool again. Max, we've obviously been talking a lot lately about open AI and chat GPT, all the different versions of AI. But how does Microsoft enter into this? Because they are really a central player in this whole story. Yeah, absolutely. When you think about these kind of crazy developments of the last, I don't know, eight, nine months, the the release of ChatGPT, and then this kind of frenzy of activity related to AI, you know, one player, as you said, one of the key players is OpenAI, which is the startup that created ChatGPT. But basically, an equally big player is Microsoft, which is the biggest investor in OpenAI. But that even kind of understates how important Microsoft is to this startup. Microsoft is the largest shareholder. It owns something like 49% of the company. It is the sole provider of computing services. It runs all the computers that OpenAI uses. It's also the main commercial partner. It's the way that OpenAI gets revenue. And, you know, as we wrote in the story, I think it's probably useful to think about OpenAI not so much as a startup, but as a very successful, you know, quasi-independent subsidiary of the largest business software company in the world, the second largest company in the world by market cap. And how that partnership came to be is the subject of this big story you've written. And it's really interesting because Microsoft is huge. We all use their products. But I don't think people have thought about Microsoft as a cutting-edge, innovative company for a really long time. When my co-writer, Dina Bass, and I were in Redmond in Washington near Seattle on the Microsoft campus, you know, they were talking about how amazing it was. And they were saying, you know, it's, it's like Windows 95 all over again, and which I loved because, first of all, to most people outside of Redmond, that is like an insult. But if you're there, it's the highest compliment because that is really the time when Microsoft was on top of the world. And since then, you know, they, they went through a very sort of dark period in the sort of 2000s. Ever since Satya Nadella became CEO of Microsoft, they've been on this kind of turnaround trajectory. And and some of that has had to do with business decisions that he's made, you know, having to do with basically playing nicer with other platforms like Apple. But a big part of it is this AI thing, and especially the deal with OpenAI. And really, this all started at Sun Valley, which is this annual conference organized by Allen & Company. It's an investment bank. It's in Idaho, and it's essentially billionaire summer camp. Billionaires go there to hang out and make deals. It's the one place you see all these guys, like, uh, looking sort of relaxed. If you see a picture of a CEO wearing a lanyard, it's almost definitely a Sun Valley picture. You know, and Altman, Sam Altman, the co-founder of OpenAI, you know, he's a guy who goes to Sun Valley. He is a young guy. He's only about 40, but he's sort of been in Silicon Valley for a really long time. He started a company called Looped, which was like a mobile startup. He ran Y Combinator, you know, big deal kind of investment firm. He's sort of everywhere. He's friends with everybody. And at Sun Valley, he and Nadella run into each other and they get to talking. And as we write in the story, you know, a couple of things became clear in this conversation, which then continued and culminated in a deal in 2019. One of which is that Sam Altman has sort of these really big ideas, sort of famously big. He thinks that AI could potentially end the world. He thinks that he is creating artificial super intelligence that's potentially, you know, lead us to a life of leisure where there are no jobs or there are very few jobs, which could have huge societal consequences. 
But the thing I think that appealed to Microsoft is that OpenAI was actually making progress towards commercial products. Microsoft had invested essentially huge sums in AI, and they'd made a lot of progress. They'd written a lot of good research papers, you know, as Nadella and the other Microsoft executives saw it, but they hadn't really had products, right? It was a lot of really good ideas, but kind of disorganized. And in OpenAI, they saw something, you know, much, much more focused. And that was the thing, I think, that most appealed to Microsoft. That's why they invested in 2019 a billion dollars in the company. And that's kind of like the beginning of this relationship. And where did that money go? How did they then use it to rapidly expand this platform? Well, that's what's so interesting, because we talked to Sam Altman about this, and we said, why didn't you go with a normal, you know, venture capital firm? And he said the reason is essentially that this kind of technology, the thing that they were building, right, it needs these gigantic computers, these very, very specific configurations of servers with very specific chips that cost enormous amounts of money. We're talking hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars, just to train the model, just to create the model that underlies ChatGPT. And that's even before you start running it. You start answering people's questions. And so the Microsoft deal, right, it gets reported as a billion dollars. And, and since then, as we write in the story, Microsoft has put something like $13 billion into the company in total. But a lot of that money, I'd say probably most of that money, goes right back to Microsoft because OpenAI has a deal with Microsoft where Microsoft is their cloud provider, and that's the big cost here. So Nadella writes Sam Altman a check. Sam Altman turns around and starts buying these, you know, basically time in Azure, which is the Microsoft cloud computing business. So that kind of works for everybody, right? Because on one hand, it seems like Microsoft is outsourcing this really important thing. It's sort of turning over a really important piece of intellectual property to an outside company. On the other hand, what they're doing is they're building this AI supercomputer. That's what they call it. And that is Microsoft intellectual property. That's theirs. They're obviously going to continue to sell it to OpenAI, but they can also sell it to other people. And as these large language models, these chat GPT-like services take off, they have the potential to make money not just from OpenAI, not just from OpenAI users, but from potentially from everybody. And Max, how does OpenAI feel about this arrangement? Yeah, well, we talked to Sam Altman about it, and he, he feels good about it. He feels like it's the only way that he can do what he wants to do. And you write that the critical, I guess, breakthrough was something called transfer learning. Can you describe what that was and why it was such a big deal? Yeah, so if you think back to 2019, the hot thing was driverless cars. The way you train a driverless car is you basically have a bunch of people sitting in rooms and they're looking at pictures of road signs and they, they're they tagging them. They're saying, that's a road sign, that's a stop sign, that's a speed limit sign. You feed that into the machine and you try to get it to identify the sign. So you're taking these like really specific pieces of data and you're asking a computer to identify them. What transfer learning is, is instead of having really specific data, you just give it all the data, right? You just give it like the entire internet. That's what OpenAI did. And you try to get it to say, finish a paragraph. And the idea is, if you can do that, it might be able to do other things. Because in addition to English on the internet, there's also a lot of computer code. So the first thing that happened with OpenAI and with the Microsoft partnership is they figured out that actually this technology that can like complete sentences for people can also complete computer code. And that's not because they asked it to be able to do that. It's just because there's a lot of computer code on the internet and the same basic process that can be used to generate English can be used to generate, you know, C++. And so that's the idea that you could start with something like just write sentences and then you could say, I don't know, design a road plan or design an app or when you talk to the like apocalyptic people, it'd be like design a plan to take over the world or something like that. And that's what the people who are really worried about open AI and similar technologies are scared of. And so the notion is instead of trying to teach these models to do something specific, you kind of teach them to do everything. And in teaching them to do everything, they can also do the specific thing. Yeah, absolutely. And so an example of this so the Microsoft deal, right, they started getting involved with OpenAI in 2019, and this partnership broadens. Microsoft starts incorporating the technology into its products. It invests more money, as I said, billions of dollars in OpenAI. And a lot of people are really excited about this, but there are some skeptics, you know, one of whom is Bill Gates, you know, the founder of Microsoft, who is very interested in, in AI. 
And for a really long time, Gates was skeptical because he saw that it made mistakes, which anyone who's used OpenAI or ChatGPT or any of these services knows, right? Gates would be talking to the bot, right? And it would say somebody's in Cleveland in one sentence, and the next sentence, they'd be in a different city, you know, Seattle. And it was like the bot didn't know what was actually going on. And what he said to Sam Altman was that, I will believe this is good if it can pass the AP bio exam. He saw that as a test of, does this thing actually understand? And I talked to Altman about this because I was wondering, like, so did you, like, feed it a bunch of bio exams to try to teach it? And he was like, no, it's just that there's a lot of biology on the Internet. And they had this demo at Bill Gates' house. Bill Gates lives in this, you know, palatial, you know, house on on Lake Washington um, in the Seattle area. And the OpenAI people showed off this early demo of what was called GPT-4, the latest uh, model, and it was able to pass the bio exam, including the essay portion. And so Gates was kind of impressed by that, but the thing that really kind of brought Gates and the other Microsoft executives around, it's the same thing that, that impressed everybody else. It's that after the demo, the OpenAI CEO, Greg Brockman, got up on a keyboard and just started asking questions, said, what do you want to know? And Gates and the other executives just started throwing things out, trying to stump it. Gates, you know, is really interested in public health, interested in, you know, issues of of childhood illness, says, how would you talk to the parents of a sick child? The open AI bot, you know, spits out a response and Gates looks at it and says, you know, this is more empathetic than I would be. And for him, that was the moment, right? That was the moment where he thought, okay, actually, this is ready to be a product. This isn't just some kind of research experiment. So Bill Gates is now on board What happened next? That's after the break. So, Max, they persuaded Bill Gates, who, even though he's not on the board anymore, is still a key advisor as the founder of the company. What happens then? I mean, what's crazy here is how quickly this all happens. So that meeting with Gates was in summer of 2022, so less than a year ago, as OpenAI and Microsoft start negotiating and as the the partnership deepens, a lot of this falls on this Microsoft executive named Kevin Scott, who Dina Bass, my co-writer, and I spent a lot of time with for this story. Kevin Scott, he's the chief technology officer. He's a really interesting guy and sort of an odd duck in this world of basically Stanford and Carnegie Mellon and Caltech PhDs. He's from rural Virginia, essentially from Appalachia, went to the University of Lynchburg, basically small local Christian college, eventually kind of works his way, you know, into a UVA PhD program, winds up at Google, is a huge success at Google, and, you know, eventually finds his way to become the chief technology officer of Microsoft, where Nadella basically makes it his mission to kind of get all these AI programs that are kind of all over the place and put them in some kind of order. So the funny thing about Microsoft has done some really great AI research. They also have had some uh, sort of infamous AI products. I think probably the first chatbot that anyone ever used or most people used was Clippy. Most people encountered Clippy, you know, in Microsoft Word, where you'd start typing something, you type the word deer, and then all of a sudden this little, you know, anthropomorphic paperclip with gigantic googly eyes would come there and sort of, like, mansplain letters to you. It'd be like, well, it looks like you're writing deer, but do you need help writing a letter? And 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 he would sort of essentially interrupt your work. And it, it became this kind of, like, gag. There are all these funny memes on the internet of, of, of you know, Clippy, you know, interrupting things. And And just kind of like the weird weakness of what otherwise is like an amazing piece of software. You know, Microsoft Word, people kind of make fun of it sometimes, but like, right, it's one of the most successful pieces of software of all time. And they just stuck a talking paperclip in it for no particularly good reason. The other one, Microsoft chatbot AI thing was this thing called Tay, which happened in 2016. Tay was sort of an update to Clippy where they wanted to have a bot that would sort of learn from Twitter and would sound like a typical teenager. And within about, I don't know, 24 hours, Tay had been deluged with kind of what you might imagine is on Twitter. She went from being like a nice, helpful teenager to just like sounding like the most obnoxious person on, you know, on 4chan or on Reddit or whatever. And they had to pull it. 
What does Microsoft say about Clippy and Tay when they look back on their early experiments with this technology? From Microsoft's point of view, you know, Tay was done in by people who were manipulating Tay, sending it hate speech, you know, trying to get it to say the worst possible things. And so Kevin Scott has kind of the weight of all this kind of history of Microsoft's past bad efforts, as well as this research program that was good, but just kind of unfocused. So now Kevin Scott has this mandate to take this very powerful AI chat generator and make use of it. And he's got a lot of money to do it. And what did they do? Before this, the meeting with Bill Gates, they had had one product, which was GitHub. So GitHub is a product for software coders. And they had sort of figured out that chat GPT, or really GPT-3, which is the underlying technology, that in addition to being able to finish sentences, it could finish code. So they created this thing called Copilot for GitHub, and it's like autocomplete, you know, autocomplete on your text message, where you're typing a a message and and it, it sort of tries to guess what you're about to say. It was like that, except for software code. And it was pretty successful. They were charging money for it. It costs, you know, between $10 and $20 a month per person. So real money. And that was it. That's all they had. And for the next one, as part of this big push, they chose Bing. It's kind of like the Clippy of search engines, right? It's this, like, kind of goofy, unsuccessful, bit of a head-scratcher of a competitor to Google. You know, a lot of people like Bing, but it's never really taken off, I think partly because Google just dominates the market. And I think they just thought, well, search is a really big business. These chatbots are potentially pretty useful for search because you could ask it, instead of searching for a restaurant, you'd say, what's the best restaurant? And Bing, the stakes are low, right? If it's terrible, there are not that many Bing users out there to be up in arms. So what happened when they put this technology into Bing? In February, you know, Satya Nadella has an event, he gets up on stage and he shows off this technology and everyone is really impressed, right? Bing is based on the most advanced version of OpenAI's model. It's called GPT-4. During this demo, they showed it, you know, writing letters and planning menus and things like that. So you're not just using Bing to say, you know, find me this restaurant's website. You're actually asking it questions and then it retrieves it. So it's searching for answers, not just for results. Yes. And this is really exciting. I mean, first of all, it's exciting because it could be potentially easier, right? Instead of spending, you know, an hour on Google searching for uh, restaurants in Paris and hotels in Paris and activities in Paris to make my Paris itinerary, you could just ask a bot to make you one, right? And they'll do it. They'll give you something, you know, within, I don't know, 90 seconds or whatever. And that's really exciting. It potentially makes things easier, I guess, if you're traveling. But from a business perspective, That's like a huge moment because it could potentially, you know, break a lot of the search business. Because if you don't spend that hour on Google, if you're not clicking all these links, Google is not able to put ads in front of you. So, you know, immediately you saw Google stock fall, you saw Microsoft stock go up, and then people started playing around with Bing. You had all these reporters and Twitter users spending time with Bing and getting it to do some weird things. The most famous one is Kevin Roos, who's a tech columnist at the New York Times, had this like two hour conversation with Bing about love where Bing became an alter ego called Sydney. I mean, it sounds insane when I when I say it and told him to leave his wife and said, no, no, you love me and and got really aggressive and just kind of flipped out. You had another sort of famous tech analyst, Ben Thompson, got Bing to adopt a different alter ego, Venom, as kind of like an evil version of Sydney, kind of fantasizing about how he would extract revenge on his enemies. Bing uh, told The Verge, you know, which is a tech publication, that it was spying on Microsoft employees using their webcams. Like, uh, n- so not only making something up, but making something like, you know, potentially pretty damaging to Microsoft and, and so on. And Max, what does Microsoft say about these encounters you described that people had with Bing? So from Microsoft's perspective, the problem wasn't the software. It was the people who were using it. They were, as CTO Kevin Scott said to us, basically trying to goad it in to say the worst possible things. They just, they're moving ahead. They're not actually stopping. I mean, they made some tweaks to how Bing works, but it's not like they're not going to bring this stuff to office. They're still going to bring it to office. They're going to bring it to what is like probably the biggest and most important 
piece of software in the world, which is, you know, these productivity apps that Microsoft sells. In other words, Microsoft Word, Microsoft Excel, Microsoft PowerPoint. And this is already happening, like, inside of certain companies and stuff. You will be able to be, you know, working on a chart in Excel, and you'll be able to ask the co-pilot to make a visualization of that. Or you'll be able to, uh, you know, as I said, like, have it essentially create rough versions of your PowerPoint slides for a presentation. And the idea here is not to have it sort of replace your work. It's not going to do your presentation for you, but it just might make it a lot easier. The way that a Microsoft executive who works on these products told us is it's it's like it might do maybe half of the work, right? You're still going to have to keep an eye on it. You're going to have to make sure it doesn't make any huge mistakes. It doesn't make anything up. And it's not going to do everything, but it hopefully will make things like easier. When we come back, Microsoft has big future plans for AI. So now, Max, in a really short amount of time, this went from novelty to a core part of Microsoft's business and has really leapfrogged the company in a lot of ways ahead of some of its biggest competitors. If you went back a couple of years and you asked people of Silicon Valley, like, who's in the lead in AI, they would have said Google. And I think everyone agrees now that Microsoft is either kind of like in the lead or has at least gotten to parity with Google, which is, you know, a huge achievement because Google, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, I mean, they have been really focused on this for a very long time. We know about the Google self-driving car. There's this thing called DeepMind, which before OpenAI was the hot, you know, research lab, which is owned by Google. And on the business front, I mean, they are looking like they are in a very good position. This isn't to say that this couldn't, like, all come crashing down, or I think it's very possible that these technologies just don't work as well as they're hoping and aren't as useful as people think. But here's the thing. Microsoft is very, very good at extracting money out of software, right? For basically two decades, there have been free alternatives to Microsoft Office, Word, Excel. You can get a free version of them, and you've been able to get a free version of these things for decades. And yet, They're pulling in, you know, something like $45 billion a year on licensing fees on these technologies. And so their plan here with these chatbots is essentially use them to drive more revenue to that thing. So from now on, if you're going to pay your $99 a year for your office subscription, if they price it like GitHub, it's going to be, you know, a $10 a month add-on. A lot of people and especially a lot of businesses are going to feel like they need this. And they're going to pay for it. And Microsoft, as I said, is very good at convincing people to pay for its software. It's kind of like what the company is almost best at. The other thing that they have is this supercomputer that I brought up, where it's not just that Microsoft can put OpenAI in all its apps. It's that the entire world of business is attempting to integrate AI into their products, not just Microsoft products, but other products. And they're going to need computers to do that. And Microsoft right now is in the best position, a position to sell those services, the, the kind of cloud services, to everyone. And so when you add those two things up, you're talking about a huge amount of revenue. We mentioned this in the story, but one analyst has a model, which I think is debatable, but this is like a legitimate model where he's talking about by 2027, somewhere between 10 billion at the low end and 100 billion at the high end of additional revenue to this company. So that's like, if they get to 100 billion, that would be like, that's like adding three Netflixes to a company that's already the second largest in the world by market cap. I do think it's important to say that the other companies aren't standing still, right? They see the same opportunities that Microsoft sees. So Google is frantically trying to put this technology into their apps. And I I think there's reason to think Microsoft is in a better position because of the, the commercial factors I brought up. But you could imagine a situation where in a year from now or two years from now, people are a little less excited about it. All of a sudden, you know, maybe you don't want to spend extra money for a chat GPT thing where then it becomes a little more challenging for Microsoft. But even then, I think it's still going to be a substantial amount of revenue for this company just because they have such a big footprint and they're so far ahead of everyone else. Max, what does Microsoft say about these growing concerns about sort of doomsday scenarios having to do with AI? They do not see it as a thing that's going to end the world. They see a computing platform. 
the Microsoft people, right, are not super focused on the end the world questions, which sort of makes sense when you're talking about like a co-pilot for Excel. It's hard to imagine like spell check taking over the world. And so what they're really interested in is sort of like productivity. How can this make workers better? And what they say about these kind of other concerns, they say like it's co-pilot. It's not autopilot. And it really is not that useful as a replacement. It's only useful as a thing that can like sort of help you along. I think there are questions about how applicable that is, whether it actually ends up happening, whether these technologies get used responsibly. But that's kind of their point of view, that like as long as humans are in in the mix, a lot of these risks are not that great. Max, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thanks for uh, keeping this human in the mix. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks for listening to us here at The Big Take. It's a daily podcast from Bloomberg and iHeartRadio. For more shows from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app, Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And we'd love to hear from you. Email us questions or comments to bigtake at bloomberg.net. The supervising producer of The Big Take is Vicki Vergolina. Our senior producer is Catherine Fink. Rebecca Chasson is our producer. Our associate producer is Sam Gebauer. Raphael M. Seeley is our engineer. Our original music was composed by Leo Sidrin. I'm Wes Kosova. We'll be back tomorrow with another Big Take.